In October 1991, Roger Allers signed on to co-direct King of the Jungle with George Scribner after serving as a storyboard artist on The Little Mermaid and The Rescuers Down Under, head of story on Beauty and the Beast, and assisting as a storyboard artist during the rewriting of Aladdin. After six months of story development work, Scribner decided to leave the project as he feuded with the producers and Allers on their decision to turn the film into a musical as opposed to Scribner's hopes of creating a documentary-like film more focused on natural aspects. Following Scribner's departure and dissatisfied with the original story, Allers, along with Don Hahn, Chris Sanders, Brenda Chapman, and Beauty and the Beast directors Kirk Wise and Gary Trousdale, conceived a new storyline for the film over the course of two days in February 1992. In April 1992, Allers was joined with Rob Minkoff, who was assigned as co-director, and the title was changed to The Lion King. For the next two years under Allers and Minkoff's directorial leadership, a team of brilliant artists crafted a film that would dazzle audiences around the world, leading to The Lion King to become the largest animated film in history. With a story that showcased to the masses again how animation could be beautiful and entertaining while also containing dark moments and heavy themes, viewers, animators, and studios were all looking forward to the stories they could tell in the coming years as they continued to explore the potential of animation. Roger Ellers especially hoped that now that he had showcased himself as both a proven veteran of animation and a leader with the ability to craft fantastic critical and financial hits, that he could set forth to create a buddy film with a talking llama voiced by David Spade. Actually, that's not what Allers hoped to do, but eventually that's what his project would inevitably become. Hello, I'm Isaac from Watso Videos, where we discuss fun topics for fun people. I'm focused on spreading magic by discussing Disney films, and today I'm going to be breaking down the story of one of the most wild productions in Walt Disney Animation history. We are going to be going on a dramatic journey to understand how one of Disney's most hilarious films was created out of the ashes of a creative dream. This is the history of the Emperor's New Groove. After the success of The Lion King, Roger Allers was asked to tell a story about South American culture, which led him to hope to tell another dramatic, heartfelt, epic musical for Walt Disney feature animation based in an ancient Inca city. This film was meant to combine that culture and classic Disney iconography with the story of Mark Twain's The Prince and the Pauper. Originally developed with Matthew Jacobs, Roger desired to tell the grand story of a common man teaching an arrogant man how to rule, which he called Kingdom of the Sun. When Roger pitched the idea to then-CEO Michael Eisner in 1994, the executive described the story as possessing all of the elements of a classic Disney film, which made Eisner confident in not only greenlighting the project, but also providing Allers with free reign to cast and create the storyline as he saw fit. Allers' concept, track record, and recent success gave him all of the freedom he needed to create his story that he described took place in a magical place that might have existed, but doesn't anymore. I think that the studio in, in recent years has really opened up and, and said, um, we don't want to keep making the same sort of film, and have given, really, uh, the people in the studio a lot of artistic license to uh, different sorts of stories. Kingdom of the Sun was set to be a tale of a greedy, selfish emperor named Manko, who finds a peasant named Pacha, who is identical to him. The emperor would then swap places with the peasant to escape his boring life, while the villainous Yzma summoned Supe, the god of death, to destroy the sun so that she could retain her youth, as she believed the sun was the reason behind her deterioration. Discovering the switch between Manko and Pacha, Yzma would threaten the peasant while transforming the real emperor into a llama to ensure that he could not stop her. But through both of the men learning to find love and the true emperor discovering humility, they would have been able to stop the vain witch Yzma and her mystical forces. Development began as early as 1994 as Roger began to work out the tale, characters, and setting he hoped to develop as he slowly attempted to form a team around him. After a little over a year of early development, in 1996, the production crew traveled to Machu Picchu in Peru in hopes of studying the Inca artifacts, architecture, landscape, and culture they were hoping to display in their film. The filmmakers hoped to capture the grandeur and scale of the empire in the clouds that had existed hundreds of years ago. 
Around this stage, the team recruited David Spade to play the selfish emperor, and Owen Wilson to play the emperor's identical peasant, and right away they appeared to work wonders in their early footage. One me would do the things I don't want to do, while the other me is having fun. Huh. Suddenly, I'm not so depressed. Eartha Kitt was also brought on to be the diabolical witch, along with the talents of Harvey Fierstein, Carla Gugino, and Laura Preppen to play the Emperor's magical stone advisor, Hakua, the Emperor's fiance, and a local llama herder, respectively. These stars were meant to bring to life aspects of Kingdom of the Sun, while the artists were attempting to develop their own style. The filmmakers created a unifying template for the Incas, their environment and the civilization they lived within to bring together all of the artists work, but while they did this they continued to look to the past. They were attempting to create something unique while also looking back to Cinderella and Peter Pan for guidance on how they should set up the work they were going to make. Animators hoped to push the familiar form of Disney animation in their own direction. At this time, legendary animator Andreas Deja, who had previously brought Jafar, Gaston, and Scar to life, was also prepared to bring Disney's next dramatic villain to the screen, along with other notable animators like Tony Bancroft, Nick Ranieri, and Bruce W. Smith. In 1997, Roger Allers followed Elton John's success with the Lion King soundtrack by personally recruiting English musician Sting to compose the songs for the film. Along with Sting also came the musician Dave Hartley, and a requirement that Sting's wife Trudy Styler would be able to document the process of production. This would later result in the infamous documentary titled The Sweatbox that never was given a commercial run. There was voice work being done, animated characters coming alive, and wonderful music being developed as the script was continuing to be refined and storyboarded. But around this time, there was a problem that was occurring. Disney's follow-ups to The Lion King, Pocahontas in 1995, and The Hunchback of Notre Dame in 1996 had both failed to receive the critical and financial backing of the public, which got the leadership at Walt Disney Animation cautious moving forward. The studio was really only doing well based on their distribution deal with the recently formed Pixar, but Disney didn't want to rely on Pixar to be successful at the box office. They didn't want to be weighed down by another heavily toned animated film. Our job is to make a film that is really entertaining, um, interesting storyline, but not too complex. In an effort to protect the studio, it became especially clear to Disney that they wanted someone else looking over Kingdom of the Sun. Disney executives just believed that directing a modern feature-length animated film was just too much work for one person to handle, which is why they usually assigned teams of directors to shepherd these massive projects through the production process. But since Roger Allers' Lion King co-director Rob Minkoff had already left the Walt Disney Company to pursue other interests at Sony Pictures, Disney felt that it was time to find someone else to partner with Allers when development was not proceeding as well as upper management would have liked. While Michael Eisner had promised him control with Kingdom of the Sun, they feared Allers' slow progression, similar plot to other Prince and the Popper stories including their own featurette that had released with Mickey Mouse in 1990, and test screenings generating poor feedback was making the film a growing risk. By bringing on a co-director with a comedic background, executives were inclined to believe that they could mitigate Kingdom of the Sun becoming another underperforming film. That's why, in hopes of streamlining and brightening the complex and dark story that Allers was creating, Randy Fulmer, the producer of Kingdom of the Sun, reached out to a new director for Walt Disney Feature Animation, Mark Dindle. Mark had impressed Disney executives with his comedy timing and wit from his directorial debut on the Warner Brothers film Cats Don't Dance. While that film did not perform well at the box office, what leadership at Disney saw was a man who had been able to capture the look and feel of great MGM music musicals of Hollywood's golden age, and were thrilled at the idea of having Mark return to Walt Disney Animation, since he had actually spent many years with the company prior to that film. He had worked on the visual effects on The Fox and the Hound, The Black Cauldron, Mickey's Christmas Carol, as well as The Great Mouse Detective, which led to him being promoted to the supervisor of visual effects on The Little Mermaid, a film where he had worked closely with Roger Allers. 
With a history at the Walt Disney Company and a connection to Allers, Disney management had hoped that Roger and Mark might combine their talents to produce another enormously entertaining and successful film for the studio. This is why, in 1997, Disney made the announcement that these two men would work together on Kingdom of the Sun as the film's directors. Unfortunately though, Allers and Dindal's ideas were having trouble blending together. Instead of working together to create a masterpiece, they were both pulling the project in two different directions and were really attempting to create two different versions of the film. For me, since Roger had started this two years before I came on, he's really had a lot of time to, to think about what, uh, what the movie's going to be and, and a lot of time to picture it in his head. So a lot of the time has just been spent trying to get up to speed with what he's thinking. Roger, possibly in hopes of topping The Lion King, was focused on creating Kingdom of the Sun into an important, sweeping, and grand experience, while Dindal was just attempting to make the movie as entertaining as it could possibly be. The sequences Mark put together were quick, funny, and light, but those moments he was creating broke up the tone and style of the serious footage that Roger had already began to produce. While leadership had hoped they would have been able to create something unique and new by bringing out the best in one another, what actually came out of the collaboration was a production that no longer had a clear vision of what they were attempting to create. The precedent of pairs working together had been set so that better ideas would emerge by ideas requiring to face challenges. But in this case, the results of the two directors on Kingdom of the Sun was conflict. As the team worked after the inclusion of Mark Dindal, there continued to be concerns over the intricate and uneven story along with the slow progress of production, but there was still a belief by many who worked on the film that this was still a film of passion that needed to be told as the epic they had signed up for. Michael Eisner and his team kept in mind that Allers had worked through these production issues before during the development of The Lion King, which kept them from intervening very much early on especially since the musical was taking form. Sting's work on the songs was leading to the catchy Rascal Flatts establishing song, Walk the Llama Llama, the devious villain song for Yzma, Snuff Out the Light, and a beautiful love song, One Day She'll Love Me. Sting would create a total of eight songs for Kingdom of the Sun, as it existed in this current form, as the mythology, beauty, and the story were being crafted. But even though scenes were being brought to life as the script and the plot were being fleshed out, many could feel through test screenings that what was being developed was not coming together. Early on in a film's life, it's expected that many changes will be required to bring the movie to a level where it's ready to be seen by the world. But in this case, the conflicted directors were making a film that was inconsistent. There was a clear split dynamic throughout the narrative and unfortunately for Allers, most test audiences did not prefer the segments he developed. Often, Mark's footage brought on loud responses while Roger's scenes brought on polite silence. The juxtaposition between these two tones made the entire film feel like it had a lack of continuity and as if the whole project was not working. For me, so much of the movie isn't working. I just don't know who I'm supposed to care about, what I'm watching. The pace seems really, really wacky. We haven't done, we have not found a movie yet. And I, I think, you know, story-wise, for me, we're between two stools. We're either a comedy, we're not a drama, we're not a this, we're not a that. Knowing that their film was not going well was difficult for the leaders, but they were motivated to make it as great as it could be. They worked diligently to rework what they had made. Unfortunately though, in the summer of 1998, the director's adjustments were not impacting test screenings or making enough progress overall to put them on track for their release date in two years. It was clear that Kingdom of the Sun would likely be unable to release with their promotional deals with McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and other companies that had been established and dependent upon the release of the film in that window. And this infuriated Disney executives. They had attempted to be patient with Allers and what he had hoped to create, but the lack of forward momentum on the film led to them demanding that something be done to ramp up the work they were doing. Around that summer of 1998, a Disney executive was even reported to have went into Randy Fulmer's office while placing his thumb and forefinger close together and angrily stated that this film was that close to being shut down. Fulmer then approached Allers to attempt to express the studio's concerns about his project, which genuinely surprised and hurt Allers to hear. 
they were progressing on what Rodgers envisioned and was disappointed that they didn't trust him on executing upon what he had pitched to them, especially after being a part of the effort that had recovered the Lion King. Allers acknowledged that the production was falling behind, but was confident that with an extension of six months, he could complete the film. But unfortunately, Fulmer denied Aller's request for an extension. Around this time, pressure from the studio continued to be felt by not only the directors, but even the animators and other employees on the film. Rumors began to fly around about the status of the movie, and whether or not the showrunners were going to be kept on or switched. No one was sure what was going to happen to Kingdom of the Sun, but the studio required them to keep moving forward, only they wouldn't do so on Aller's idea for the film. In hopes of telling the story of how a common man could teach an arrogant man how to be a good leader, Peter Schneider and president of Walt Disney Animation, Tom Schumacher, began to look for new outlines of Kingdom of the Sun that would streamline the plot. Instead of remaining on course to finish Roger Aller's grand scale dramatic musical, six new outlines of the film were considered as they continued to progress. And the one they chose came from the last ditch effort of a storyboard artist, Chris Williams. What Chris pitched was a completely new storyline that really only hung onto the idea from Kingdom of the Sun that a prince would be turned into a llama, and immediately Peter and Tom were convinced that this new concept was the direction they wanted this project to go. There would be no epic, there would be no musical, and the plot elements of the romance between the llama herder Pacha and Manko's betrothed Nina, the sun-capturing villain scheme, similarities to the Prince and the Pauper story, and the exploration of Inca mythology were dropped. Roger's concept was mostly stripped of his vision, resulting in the 25% of his film that had been animated, along with the songs that had been developed to that point, being worthless. Due to poor test screenings, creative differences between Allers and Dindle, and production falling behind schedule, the original concept of Kingdom of the Sun was finished. Roger, feeling Disney had lost confidence in his ability to create his project into a viable film, decided soon after that these decisions would lead to him leaving the project. As a result, on September 23, 1998, Kingdom of the Sun became dormant with production costs amounting towards $25 to $30 million. Similarly to how Roger had been a part of the massive shift in King of the Jungle, which led to director George Scribner exiting to allow the rest of the filmmakers to create The Lion King, Mark, Randy, Tom, Peter, and the rest of the Disney executives overseeing Kingdom of the Sun had now caused a similar shift that led to Roger feeling he could not be a part of what Disney was doing anymore. Just, uh, I don't know. I sort of feel like I'm standing here with like fragments of like confetti falling through my fingers. It's, it's I mean, uh, I don't know. I was up half the night just sort of grieving over this whole thing, I, you know. His hopes and aspirations for Kingdom of the Sun would forever be unable to come to fruition, just as George Scribner would never see the King of the Jungle come about as he had pictured that work. But in both cases, even though there had been creative conflict, heartbreak, and a departure from a leader, a group of artists would do their best to work together to create a memorable experience for audiences. Old ideas lived on, but were now in a completely different form. Kingdom of the Sun would live on with this new concept being developed, but Disney executives were still not happy. Aller's departing was the mishap that finally sent CEO Michael Eisner over the edge. He was furious with the mess Kingdom of the Sun had become and told Disney Feature Animation that they had two weeks to convince him that there was an affordable way to save this animated project or else he would kill the entire production. In the next weeks, Dindle and Fulmer convinced Eisner to keep the film afloat, they changed the name to Kingdom in the Sun, were allowed to shut down production for six months to completely overhaul the story with Chris Williams and screenplay writer David Reynolds assisting them, and due to these delays in production, they were eventually allowed to push back the release date by six months. Ironically, Dindle and Fulmer were saving the project through the very means Allers had requested throughout his time on Kingdom of the Sun. A lot of the issues came from two directors with different visions with executives being unwilling to allow for an extension on the production schedule. But now, Mark Dindle had both of those freedoms at his disposal. 
While there were definitely issues with how Kingdom of the Sun progressed, the support of executives appeared to have went a long way in being able to create a successful film, as seen by their backing of Mark Dindle's new concept. Disney's prehistoric epic Dinosaur was then rushed forward to summer 2000 to compensate for Kingdom in the Sun's extension, while animators were sent to work on the Rhapsody in Blue segment in Fantasia 2000. What Dindle and Fulmer's team was able to develop in their half a year hiatus was a completely new screenplay that mainly pulled from the concept of an emperor becoming a llama, along with moments during test screenings that audiences had enjoyed, while abandoning the rest. Chris Williams came up with the idea of transforming the character Pacha from a young individual to a middle-aged adult, which removed Owen Wilson from the role to be replaced by John Goodman. With this new version of Pacha, David Reynolds then developed the idea that Pacha and the Emperor Cusco could be paired together when Cusco becomes a llama to go on a buddy adventure while being chased by Yzma and her new sidekick Kronk, voiced by Patrick Warburton. Harvey Fierstein, Carla Gugino, and Laura Preppen were all let go from the project as well. But Harvey's character Hakua lives on in the final version of the film, holding candles at Yzma's dinner. These cast changes were made official around the time that production of the film was beginning again in the summer of 1999. This retooled film had a drastically simplified plot compared to the original idea in hopes of giving the filmmakers more freedom to develop the characters and allow those large personalities and interactions to create the humor they desire to showcase. When production finally began again in 1999, some artists were unwilling to return now that the story had been altered in such a massive way, and there would be a reduction in the special effects and cinematic techniques that were being created in favor of focusing on the qualities of the characters themselves. These story and artistic changes led to Andreas Dejia feeling disappointed that the version of Yzma he created would be unable to return to this version of the film. Dejia decided to instead go to work on a wild little film where an alien would arrive on Earth. Over there, he would be responsible for animating the innocent, misunderstood girl, Lilo. Even though some members of the original team had left, 400 artists and 300 technicians and production personnel began to furiously develop and animate this new story, while voice actors were brought in to record their new lines, and Sting developed the final two songs Dindle and Fulmer envisioned for the film. They requested a song that could be played at both the beginning and the end of the film with different lyrics to chronicle the transformation of Emperor Cusco and a song that would be able to play during the credits and would showcase the themes of the film. Although Stang was frustrated that all of the songs he'd created for Kingdom of the Sun had been removed, and he was now focusing on his own album, he was willing to complete the music he promised to create even while he was on tour. In February 2000, Disney's Ink and Film was officially announced to be renamed to its final title, The Emperor's New Groove, with its release date being December of 2000. And now, they were creators racing towards the finish. Unfortunately though, The Emperor's New Groove's deviation from Kingdom of the Sun, along with this shifted release, brought about comparisons to the opposing animation studio DreamWorks' March of 2000 release, The Road to El Dorado. There had been a sort of race between the studios to release this Southern American buddy comedy film as they had done previously with other films like Pixar's A Bug's Life and DreamWorks' Ants. But even though some would inevitably find similarities, Dindle and Fulmer denied any connection between what DreamWorks had done with The Road to El Dorado and kept moving forward. When screenings of The Emperor's New Groove began, executives approved of what they had come up with so far and set them to keep going with this new direction, only hoping that they would be able to keep up the comedy momentum that they had set up in the first act. Overjoyed, the filmmakers pushed forward continuously evolving what they were creating in the final months leading up to the release. They were taking characters and sequences in and out. The process just kept going around and around as the entire crew sped towards the completion of the film. It keeps changing, changing. and therefore it will change and change and change and change. And it is that additive process that keeps making it Although fresh. I don't recall one that quite has changed. <laughs> We always say, oh, this is normal. No. Everything's like, we've never been through this before. <laughs> One massive change that occurred towards the end of the development of The Emperor's New Groove was the ending itself. Originally at the film's end, 
Cusco would build his Cusco Topia on the neighboring hill over a forest near Pacha's home, where he would subsequently invite his new family to. Stang pointed out through a formal letter to the team creating the film that he would resign if they didn't alter this scene, for he had spent 20 years of his life defending the rights of indigenous people, and was horrified to see this character march over other people to build a theme park. He pointed out that Cusco should have learned that he didn't need to construct a lavish structure for himself to be happy. From this comment, the filmmakers agreed with his analysis, resulting in the final conclusion that is seen in the film, with Cusco building a modest shack near Pacha's own home, since he has learned that his perfect world is created by the people around him. Amongst the chaos of the final stretch of animation and the alteration to the ending of the film, the team also felt forced to switch composers at the last minute from Mark Sheeman to John Debney. In screenings, viewers found Mark's score to be too over the top and became distracting, so they asked him to step down. In his place, John came in and allowed the score to fall to the background during gags and instead be present to highlight the emotional undertones of the story. Leading up to the inevitable release date, Eisner did have concerns that this new story was too close to the tone of Hercules, which performed below expectations at the box office. Dindle and Fulmer attempted to assure him, though, that the Emperor's New Groove would have a much smaller cast, making it easier to attract audiences. With Eisner's doubts, though, Disney conducted a relatively restrained marketing campaign, really only partnering with McDonald's to create Happy Meal toys based on the film, instead focusing their efforts to promote their own 102 Dalmatians for its Thanksgiving release. That's why when the day finally came for The Emperor's New Groove to release on December 15th, 2000, it premiered fourth at the box office on its opening weekend. While the film was not a titan financially, reviews were good. Critics recognized that The Emperor's New Groove did not possess the technical polish of past works or the epic nature of many, but it was nevertheless a goofy, funny, slapstick film with charming aspects. Some believed the film would only leave audiences looking back to Disney's past of designing stories that had more to latch onto for the whole family when it was made up of creating dwarves, beauties, and poisoned apples. But others praised the picture for being one of the best films released after Disney's wave of successes and was being proclaimed as the most hilarious feature film Disney had ever brought to the silver screen. While The Emperor's New Groove performed disappointingly at the box office compared to Disney films released during their renaissance in the 1990s, grossing $169.3 million on a $100 million budget, the following year, the film gained popularity through its DVD sales. In 2001, the Emperor's New Groove became the best-selling DVD of the year, leading to the characters and the laughs that came from them being shared to a far larger audience than during its theatrical release. This new momentum from the DVD market gave the Walt Disney Company a stronger confidence in the property going forward, as people fell in love with Cusco, Kronk, Pacha, and of course the hilarious, diabolical, and brilliant Yzma. On December 13th, 2005, Disney Toon Studios released their direct-to-DVD spin-off film of The Emperor's New Groove, titled Kronk's New Groove. At the time, when the film was under production, Mark Dindle and Randy Fulmer had moved on within Walt Disney Animation to direct and produce Chicken Little, respectively. But that whole film's production is a story for another day. Eventually, Dindle would lead the creation of an Emperor's New Groove sequel series, The Emperor's New School, for the Disney Channel. This show ran from January 27, 2006 to November 20th, 2008, and chronicled Cusco's adventures through school before he can officially be crowned as the true emperor. Incredibly, both of these follow-up projects had the grand majority of the voice acting cast return, with David Spade being one of the few names to be absent for the entirety of the Emperor's New School. Around the theatrical release, Disney had sold a video game for PlayStation, Windows, and the Game Boy Color based on the film, while also selling some plush toys to be sold in Disney stores. In addition, these original characters also made their rounds within the Disney parks and cruises around the world, with Yzma as the most popular amongst them in shows and parades, with the occasional appearance of Cusco and Kronk as well, to humor crowds and bring a smile to those who have fallen in love with these wild and fun Disney characters. From the mind of one of the men who brought you The Lion King came a concept for a film that was meant to wow audiences with its grand, epic, and powerful music, characters, and story. 
what was pitched as a massive new animated picture that would combine adventure, comedy, romance, and mysticism fell to the wayside when production began to slow. Two contradicting ideas were being created, test screenings were not proceeding positively, and the underperformance of other large stories began to make Disney executives fearful of what would happen when their next film was to be released. Unfortunately, executives lost their faith in Roger Eller's vision of Kingdom of the Sun, and without this trust, he also lost the freedom, time, and resources required for him to fulfill the film he had began. But his project continued to progress without him through the work of Mark Dendel and Randy Fulmer. With these filmmakers leading the creation of this film, they streamlined the plot, focusing more on characters and humor above creating a theatrical spectacle. While we will never know what Kingdom of the Sun might have become, what was created by the team at Disney was a hilarious romp filled with slapstick, iconic lines, amazing voice actors, unique gags, and a brilliant, brilliant villain, and a common villager who helped turn a selfish emperor into a compassionate man.